Let's talk about corn. Most countries know it as maize, and it's been cultivated for thousands of years. It's used in many different food items, from oils to cereals. But corn on its own is often a staple dinner item, especially during North American Thanksgiving. The average ear of corn has about 800 kernels in 16 rows, and there is one silk for every kernel. The differences between the varieties lie in the kernel color, white, yellow, bicolor, ear size, and sweetness. Normal, SU. This type is flavorful, stress tolerant, and vigorous. It's not as sweet as other hybrid varieties because its sugar turns into starch quickly after picking. The kernels are tender and creamy, but when the sugar turns into starch, they get chewy. Sugar enhanced, SE, SE plus, EH, everlasting heritage. This type falls between normal and super sweet in terms of stress tolerance, vigor, sweetness, flavor, and how fast its sugar turns into starch. Super sweet, SH2, shrunken. This type of corn contains two to three times more sugar than other hybrids. The sugar in the kernels turns into starch very slowly, giving them a much wider harvest window. They have a crispy texture, are less creamy, and are more easily stressed by cold and other problems. They also need to be isolated from normal and sugar-enhanced varieties in order to pollinate. Note, it's difficult to maintain the vigor and sweetness in open-pollinated varieties, so hybrids are typically used instead. Corn germinates best in soil that is between 65 degrees and 95 degrees Fahrenheit, 18 degrees and 35 degrees Celsius. And if the soil isn't warm enough, the seeds will rot before they can germinate. It's best to always start outside after the last frost. Most gardeners plant fungicide-treated seeds, but if you want to use untreated seeds instead, make sure that your soil has properly warmed up to at least 65 degrees Fahrenheit. If your soil is cooler than that, it's more likely your seeds will get infected by diseases. Here are the steps for planting your corn seeds. Step one, if possible, plant your seeds in blocks of at least four rows for good wind pollination. Step two, plant your seeds one to two inches, two to five centimeters deep, unless you have SH2 seed, which you'll want to either plant shallower or in cool soil. Keep your seeds about four to six inches, 10 to 15 centimeters apart, in rows that are 30 to 36 inches, 76 to 91 centimeters apart. Note, when you start two different varieties with varying maturities, you can have a longer harvest season, but make sure not to plant the SH2 variety next to SU and SE slash SE plus varieties. We'll tell you everything you need to know about ideal growing conditions, fertilizer and mulch, and watering best practices. We'll also talk transplanting, companion planting, as well as your growing structure options. Their ideal soil pH is 5.8 to 6.8, and the soil needs to be nice and fertile. Also, corn is a heavy feeder, so nitrogen is an especially important nutrient that it will need. Keep in mind that it's not necessary to remove side sprouts from your corn plant. In reality, removing them may actually reduce your yields. Here's how to care for your corn crop. Step one, mount some soil around the stems of your plant when it's about six inches, 15 centimeters tall. This will anchor your corn, keeping its roots covered and cool. Step two, when plants are three to four inches tall, you can thin them to 18 to 12 inches, 20 to 30 centimeters for ideal spacing. Step three, control any weed growth until your crop is about knee high, then leave it alone. Corn will actually form a canopy of leaves that will keep new weeds from growing. Step four, give your corn about one inch of water per week and make sure not to let your plants suffer from a lack of water while the kernels are forming. It's during this part of the growing process that it needs water the most. Step five, corn has a shallow root system, so don't cultivate too deeply or you could damage your plants. Note, you will see many new roots developing above the soil. These are not for water or nutrient absorption, but simply to stabilize the plant as it grows taller. Fertilizer and or mulching. 
Since corn is a heavy feeder, you'll need to use manure or compost as well as fertilizer. You can use one pound, 500 grams, of a complete organic fertilizer per 60 feet, six meters of row, by mixing it thoroughly into each seed furrow, a long, narrow trench. When your plants are about two feet tall or have eight to 10 leaves, reapply one cup of fertilizer for every 10 feet of garden row. Scatter it evenly between the rows, mix it with the soil, then water your plants. Mulching helps to maintain soil moisture and control weed growth. Wood chips, uninfected plant residue, or straw are all great options to use. Transplanting best practices. Although we don't recommend it, you can start corn seeds inside and transplant them outdoors once the temperatures are warm enough. You can start about three to four weeks before you plan to transplant your seedlings outside. Just keep in mind that corn plants grow best when the last frost has passed and there is no more danger of sudden cold. Companion plants do's and don'ts. Do's. The traditional three sisters are corn, beans, and squash. It's best to plant a corn variety that you won't harvest until later in the season so that you don't have to step over and disturb growing squashes and beans in order to harvest your corn. Also, lettuce benefits from the shade of this tall growing plant, and pole beans can climb up the stalks. As well, amaranth makes a great mulch and competes with pesky weeds. You can also plant sunflowers of a similar height between your corn rows to separate varieties that need isolation from each other. Want more options? Cucumber, beets, dill, melons, parsley, and potatoes are all good for growing as a companion plant. Don'ts. Celery doesn't make a good companion, and neither do tomatoes, since they get attacked by the same worm as corn. Growing structure options. Container. You can grow corn in a container, as long as it's big enough to allow block planting. This planting process is important so that your corn can have sufficient pollination by wind. The container also needs good water drainage to prevent diseases from growing in too wet soil. Raised beds. They should be at least six feet long and four feet wide to provide enough space for block planting. You will get the most space when you sow your corn directly into the ground. Preferably, the soil will be fertile and evenly watered as well as free from any pre-existing harmful diseases. In general, you can prevent diseases and nutritional exhaustion by rotating your crops every four years, and also by composting any old stalks. Potential pests. Aphids. These tiny pests come in a variety of colors, green, black, red, light orange, or yellow and mainly feed on the undersides of leaves and stems. What they're actually feeding on is the sap in plants, which ends up causing the plants damage. Aphids also leave behind a sticky substance called honeydew, and they are a pest that's known to spread diseases. Aphids can be tolerated by most plants when their numbers are low, but if there's a lot of aphids, they can stunt a plant's growth and cause a plant's leaves to turn yellow and fall off. Here's what to do. For the most part, plants can handle mild aphid infestations. But if they're found, a strong jet of water from a garden hose will wash them off the plants. Spraying plants with water should be done early in the morning so that the plants can dry off during the day. Sticky traps, neem oil, insecticidal soaps, and horticultural oils are also effective against aphids. Just be sure to follow the application instructions on the packaging. Oftentimes, you can also get rid of aphids by wiping or spraying the leaves with a mild solution of water and a few drops of dish soap. One variation includes adding a pinch of cayenne pepper. Soapy water should be reapplied every two to three days or about two weeks. As well, you can try to attract beneficial insects like lady beetles, hoverflies, and lacewings all of which are important aphid predators. Make sure to check all transplants for aphids before planting. And keep in mind that aphids aren't very mobile, 
so it's not uncommon to find one heavily affected plant surrounded by plants that are fine. If this is the case, simply remove and destroy the infected plant. Army worms. Army worms are green, reddish, or black caterpillars that heavily feed on the leaves of plants, turning them into skeleton leaves that are filled with lots of irregular or circular shaped holes. These pests are most active in the early morning and the late evening, which are the best times to check for damage. Here's what to do. You can use natural enemies like wasps and flies to help keep army worms in check. Also, if you're using insecticides, it's best to do so in the twilight hours. This is when those insecticides will be the most effective. It's also important to control the growth of weeds because they serve as cover for army worms. Finally, you can simply hand pick any army worms off the plants. Cabbage Looper. Light to dark green caterpillars with wavy white lines on their back and sides and a distinctive arch in their back when they move. They feed on the leaves of a plant, which is also where they hide, causing ragged, large holes to appear. The damage they cause to plants is often quite severe. Here's what to do. Looper numbers are usually held in check by their natural enemies, other insects. If they do become problematic, loopers can be hand-picked from the plants. You can also apply certain safe bacteria, which effectively kills the younger larvae, as well as insecticidal soaps. Just try to avoid using chemical sprays, because they will also damage helpful insects. Weeds attract and shelter these pests, so it's also important to keep weed growth under control. Pests can also be prevented and controlled by using row cover slash insect netting when sowing or transplanting. As well, be sure to quickly remove any crop residue after harvest to prevent the looper from having a place to survive in over the winter. Cutworms. These are gray worms that curl their bodies around the stem of a plant and feed on it, which causes the plant to be cut off just above the soil surface. When their numbers are high, they can cause severe damage to the garden by causing plants to wilt and die off. Cutworms feed at night and hide in plant debris during the day, and they prey more on nutrients plants, seedlings, or young plants since their stems are more tender. There are a number of different types, but the most common are red-backed, dark-sided, and dingy cutworms. Here's what to do. Hand pick any cutworms from the plants after dark, when they're most active. Also, keep a three to four foot buffer of dry soil along the edge of the garden to make it unattractive to cutworms. As well, remove plant residue to help reduce egg laying sites and get rid of weeds, which can host young cutworm larvae. Be sure to till the garden before planting, which helps to expose and kill any larvae that might be present. Also, use compost instead of green manure, since manure might encourage egg laying. As well, Try placing aluminum foil or cardboard collars around the plants to create a barrier, which will stop cutworm larvae from feeding. Simply place the collars around the plants so that one end is pushed a few inches into the soil and the other end is several inches above the ground. Adding a layer of mulch will also help to prevent any cutworms from reaching the soil surface. And natural predators like wasps and ground beetles also help to control cutworm infestations. Finally, try spreading diametaceous earth, essentially a soft powder made from the bones of tiny aquatic creatures around the plant's base. This creates a sharp barrier that will keep cutworms out. Corn earworm. Its larvae will damage leaves, as well as most other parts of a plant. The younger caterpillars are a creamy white color with a black head and black hairs. Here's what to do. Make sure to monitor plants for eggs and young larvae. Certain safe bacteria can be applied to control corn earworms, but keep an eye out for natural enemies, which are good bugs to have, that could be damaged by using chemicals, since these natural enemies help keep pests in check. Nematodes. 
also known as roundworms. Nematodes are microscopic worms that live in the soil, as well as inside plant tissue. They stunt the growth of plants and cause galls, swelled growths, to form on a plant's roots, leaving them quite deformed. As well, leaves can become pale and twisted. Crops will eventually turn yellow from the damage and will then wilt in hot weather. A plant's yield can be affected by nematode damage, and in extreme cases, plants can die off entirely. Here's what to do. Practice crop rotation and plant-resistant varieties. As well, be sure to remove infected plants or plant residue to prevent nematodes from spreading to the next round of crops. Plant roots can be checked for galls, swelled growths, either mid-season or earlier if symptoms appear. If any galls are found, those affected plants should then be removed. Also, avoid spreading nematodes by thoroughly cleaning any garden equipment and by not moving any infected soil. Seed corn maggot. These maggots are yellowish white in color with a pointed head and no legs. They attack either the seeds or the roots of a plant and are often attracted to seeds when they have already been affected by diseases or insects. When seeds are attacked by seed corn maggots, which is usually while the seeds are germinating, the attack keeps those seeds from growing. Here's what to do. Plant resistant varieties to avoid having a seed corn maggot problem. If these pests are present, then any and all infected seedlings will need to be removed and destroyed. Also, it helps to avoid using heavy compost or manure, since these substances attract the maggot flies that would lay eggs on the plant. Slugs and snails. These slimy pests are either hard-shelled or soft, and they are nocturnal creatures who feed on the leaves and stems of a plant during the night. The feeding damage from these pests leaves irregular shaped holes behind. Leaves can also be shredded or eaten entirely. And there will also be slime trails on nearby rocks, plants, and walkways. These pests thrive in damp conditions, damage a plant's growth, and also affect a plant's ability to form roots. Here's what to do. Wet conditions encourage slugs and snails. So, although it's important to keep the soil moist, it's just as important not to overwater any plants. As well, avoid overhead watering and keep any organic waste away from plants. If possible, hand pick any slugs or snails at night, which is when those pests are most active. Beer traps are another way to handle a snail or slug problem. For this, dig a hole in the ground and place a large cup or bowl into the hole. It's best to use something with steep sides so that the slugs can't crawl back out when they're done, like a mason jar. Fill the jar about half full with beer and let it sit overnight. In the morning, the jar should then be full of drowned slugs that can then be flushed down the toilet. Another option is to place a barrier of diametaceous earth a natural powder made up of the skeletons of tiny aquatic creatures around plants to keep snails and slugs away. Potential diseases and their solutions. Common smut. This fungus causes firm, tumor-like growths on the leaves, stems, ears, and tassels of corn. Here's what to do. Look for these growths during the season and cut the growths out before the growths can produce spores. Be sure to remove heavily infected plants, but don't compost them. And plant-resistant varieties like Top Notch, Temptation, Sweet Rhythm, Sweet Symphony, and Zenith. Corn Leaf Blight. A disease causing gray or brown lesions to appear on affected plants. These lesions can then spread in long veins over the leaves of corn plants. Here's what to do. After harvest, bury any crop residue deep into the ground. As well, practice crop rotation 
and do not let corn follow beans, tomatoes, southern peas, okra, or peanuts. Downy mildew. This fungal disease thrives in cool, humid climates. At first, downy mildew causes leaves to turn yellow, typically starting from the main vein, then spreading outward. Fungal spores that are grayish, purple, fuzzy spots will then grow on the undersides of leaves. Downy mildew typically affects young, tender leaves, and severe infections can also cause curled and distorted leaves. Sometimes those affected leaves can then become dehydrated and then drop from the plant entirely. When seedlings are affected, their growth is stunted, and downy mildew can also reduce crop yields while acting as an entry point for other diseases. When older plants are affected, in addition to the lesions they get, they will also seem more rigid and narrow as compared to healthy plants. Here's what to do. Plant resistant varieties when possible. Practice good crop rotation. Ensure good air circulation around plants and water plants early in the morning. This last tip gives the plants enough time to dry out during the day, making those plants less vulnerable to infection. Downy mildew is usually spread when leaves are wet for too long, so it also helps to avoid overhead watering. As well, be sure to keep weeds from growing. Once plants have downy mildew, the best thing to try is to eliminate moisture and humidity around the infected plants. If possible, try to improve their air circulation through selective pruning. In general, downy mildew normally clears itself up in an outdoor garden once the weather warms up, since it doesn't do well in warm temperatures. Also, if there are any infected plants, be sure to remove all crop remains after harvest to avoid reinfection, since this fungus can survive in crop residue. Keep in mind too that downy mildew is much easier to control when a plant's leaves and fruit are kept protected by a copper spray. Copper treatments can begin two weeks before the disease normally appears and when a long period of wet weather is in store. Copper treatments can also start when the disease first appears. Then those treatments can be repeated at seven to 10 day intervals for as long as the treatments are needed. Maize dwarf mosaic virus. Spread by insects, the typical symptom of this virus is a mosaic pattern on the leaves of affected plants. It can also cause lesions to grow on the corn. Here's what to do. Plant resistant or tolerant varieties when possible. As well, remove any Johnson grass that's in or around the planting area, as this weed can spread the virus further. Rust. A fungal disease, rust is mainly found on the undersides of leaves. Rust spots will first appear off-white and puffy, later becoming the red, brown, circular raised spots that are unique to rust fungi. These spots will be powdery and are often surrounded by a yellow halo. Typically, rust will cause a plant to lose its leaves. Here's what to do. Practice crop rotation by rotating with non-host crops and plant disease resistant varieties when possible. It can also help to plant crops early in the season. Also avoid long periods of leaf wetness when temperatures are warm, which are the perfect conditions for this virus. Be sure to also disinfect poles, trellises, or other equipment to avoid the risk of infection in the future. If crops are infected with rust, pull up the diseased plants and destroy those crops. Harvesting. Corn is ready to be harvested when the silks on top of an ear are brown and dry, when the cob starts drooping, and when the kernels release a milky juice when they are cut. Depending on the hybrid you've planted, you'll have a certain amount of time to harvest the ears before the sugar in their kernels turn into starch. On average, you can pick your ears over a five to seven day period. The best time to harvest your corn is either early in the morning or later in the evening when the weather is cool. To pick the ears, simply hold the stalk below the ear 
then twist the tip of the ear towards the ground until it breaks off. Storing. Corn tastes best when you prepare it right after harvest. Depending on the variety though, it can actually stay fresh for up to seven days in the refrigerator. Freezing is another option to preserve your corn if you'd like more long-term storage. Bonus, if you have a pressure canner at home, then you can also can your corn.